Hi, good afternoon. It's Gene from Mavstar Observatory. Guys, a little bit later on in the video, we're going to talk about a common misconception uh, with regards to what is taking place over the Far Eastern side, uh, both over the Northern Hemisphere and both over the Southern Hemisphere. What's going on with the North and South Pole? A lot of people think that they're merging together. And a little bit later on in this video, we're going to prove that that is not the case. Um, before we get into that, uh, obviously one of our superstars over in the Gold Coast, Richard, has sent us some new data uh, of nearly two months worth of his reading, so we'll get into that as well. And we'll also make a comparison with what is going on in Perth and uh, in on the Gold Coast, so both west and east uh, coasts of Australia. And we're going to be focusing more on this video on what is taking place in Australia again uh, it is largely due to this misconception of people believing that the poles both over the northern hemisphere and summer hemisphere are merging together and at some point uh, in the future people believe that that will be the case that they will meet somewhere around the equatorial or at least barley region of um, you know the equatorial region on our planet so uh, before we get into that, big thanks uh, to those few people that supported um, and pledged a little bit of help towards the channel and what we do. Uh, without you guys, we couldn't physically, uh, you know, make it possible to do these uh, YouTube videos and add the data that we get uh, from the channel. And equally, without our superstars supplying the data for us at different stations and locations around the world, we simply wouldn't have the data for you guys. So, you know, it is great that a few people um, do realise the importance of what we're trying to do here and recognise, you know, the amount of effort that we're putting in. And obviously, if you've been following me for the last five or maybe ten years, you've been with me for a long time. Uh, you'll also know that the, you know I'm very passionate about this topic because of some of the implications that we could face possibly in the future like I discussed in yesterday's video the worst case scenario our magnetosphere doesn't recover and we end up going down the path of what Mars did in its distant future uh, past sorry so you know uh, I suppose it'd be a good idea as well to talk about the best case scenario well it's um, you know, just briefly touch on that. I suppose the best case scenario would be another excursion where, you know, there isn't a completed reversal for a prolonged period of time and it goes back to its origination, uh, which means, you know, the poles eventually go back to Canada. Even if that is the case, remember it took a 100 years for the pole to leave Canada to reach its destination now and has travelled perhaps 1,600 miles um, in 120 years. And as it has been going over the Northern Hemisphere, if you've been following the videos that we put up on YouTube and obviously the data on our website, you'll know that it has been covering recently more distance in a short period of time. So let's have a look at the data that Richard sent us. Um, in all honesty, it looks to me like there has been a slight increase in the intensity over the Gold Coast. And when we compare that with Perth, Australia, we see that it's the same case scenario over the last month or so and we are due soon to get some more data from um, Perth Australia as well as some uh, muon readings uh, you can see that there has been a slight increase over the last couple of months and you know it's surprising really uh, because we're going to move into the second part of this video where we look at some uh, animation based on the data that was collected for swarm and when we look at that data, uh, this common misconception of you know the two poles appearing to merge together uh, over the equatorial region um, is not uh, really the case because what we are seeing over the southern hemisphere is a shrinkage of the safe pole, and you know it just makes you wonder what will happen you know if that continues to shrink we've also got a shrinkage taking place over Canada and I'm just going to pull up that video now so you can see it and you'll get an idea of what we're talking about so just bear with me so the imagery that we're looking at covers a, a time period I believe of about 17 
years or thereabouts. Starts at 2000 or 1999, but what we will see at the beginning, uh, at the lowest year that it's got, 1999, uh, there's a jump in just this region here, which is now peaking over Australia. And you'll see when it goes back to an earlier date that it actually shows us that at the point where the uh, data started to come in and the image starts that the intensity was further over the continent of Australia but towards the end around 2016 you'll see when the video goes back to the beginning 1999 it jumps back so the intensity on the bottom center disc is what we're looking at over Australia you'll see it drop back that's an indication of the intensity closing in on the actual pole which is unusual uh, because that's not the case what we're seeing over the northern hemisphere we're just seeing the intensity of Canada drop off and I believe at quite an alarming rate uh, the other thing is if we look at the top right hand disc you'll see that it's focusing on Antarctica and you can see as you watch the video that the safe magnetic pole or dipole leaves the peninsula over the period of the recording of this data but you'll also notice that um, the intensity, which is sort of like central over Antarctica, also is reducing. So not only are we getting a, a reduction on the one side, which is covering Antarctica, we're also getting a reduction of the other side, which is touching on Australia. So, you know, this could be uh, down to the increase in the safe Atlantic anomaly spreading. It could be pushing the high intensities away from the low intensities or there could be something else going on in the core of our earth and the only way we're going to find out is just by continue to monitoring it but i will say this just looking at the last month's worth of data from both perth and on the gold coast both east and west coast of australia we do see a slight increase and you know it's very difficult um you know when we are watching these very slow uh, movements in on the continent of Australia to make a prediction as to what is going on and the other thing is is that we simply don't have any data of as to what happened during the last magnetic reversal or the last completed magnetic reversal so we are um, in new territory every day you know we're just trying to piece together the evidence to give us an idea of what is actually taking place on our earth uh, th there are some things that are very clear. We do know that during a magnetic reversal, the magnetosphere uh, shield that protects us from cosmic radiation weakens considerably. And that in turn allows a lot more cosmic rays into our upper atmosphere. And in turn, we know now that that sets up clear cloud seeding um, nuclei which allows water droplets to condense and increase in the condensation and obviously when it reaches um, its journey along the jet stream as it goes uh, from north to south or from polar jet streams to subtropical jet streams both northerly and southerly on the hemispheres of our earth we know that it's got a chance of over dropping a load of rain or a load of snow it, it just depends on you know where uh, you know the jet stream is moving at a given time and how much um, nuclearization is taking place in the upper atmosphere with regard to cloud seeding so we know from this in any case that this is enough on its own to be concerned with we don't really need to focus on the worst case scenario like we did in the video yesterday but i do feel and the reason why i did mention it is that you know we cannot outrule anything and from the, the um, you know, the information that I provided in yesterday's video, you will know we are less than three years away from possibly seeing an acceleration of the magnetic poles, possibly as they leave the strong magnetic field lines of the planet, which holds the poles in its current position or allows the poles to migrate slowly. It then surpasses that region of 40 degrees and goes into the weak field lines and we see a rapid acceleration of the poles and possibly at that point a pole reversal so that's where we are guys you know and um, again i just want to thank those people that are making this research and you know the ability for our observatory to continue going through the donations that they are helping us out with you know this is really 
the biggest news and the topic of this century uh, or even uh, for the entire humanity uh, over you know the last 20,000 years this hasn't happened so we are living in very rare times where you know I feel it is important to at least cover this topic to you know a, a, a certain amount of degree because you know it doesn't at the end of the day affect us even if we directly don't see it it does and you know our uh, food production bowl of the earth is shrinking as this is ha- taking place because crops are getting wiped out through you know frosts that never um, you know touched us low down in the equatorial regions by China South Sea Islands you know we've seen thousands of heads of cattle freeze to death we've seen crops get destroyed as not just a result of frozen uh, first time or once time or breaking record times um, weather anomalies but we also see it being destroyed by floods now and droughts and that is down to you know these super jet streams that we have uh, where you know 20 years ago only 20 years ago guys on this planet we enjoyed jet streams both at 60 degrees north the polar jet stream and 30 degrees where the subtropical uh, lies both over the northern and southern hemispheres so uh, that's our update for today uh, there's a link down there if you want to help support us we are running uh, in the red at the moment at the observatory and that is because we have had a couple of um, large uh, donators fall off as a result of the um, current pandemic affecting their industry and you know it would be great if a few more people would take up a bit of that slack and just you know help us out a little bit um you know i am trying to after christmas at some point in the new year i know uh, with the way things are going you know my plans are getting pushed further and further away but what i wanted to do is make this uh self-funded uh you know where we don't have to ask for donations anymore uh you know i'm hoping that i can um you know come up with something in the new year um again these plans are being pushed you know uh, back a little bit uh, so we're going no, not no longer into january and february perhaps march and april now uh, as a result of the current climate and things but you know what i would like to do is um make it free for all and not to have to ask for any uh, funding but the only way i can do that is um if things improve with the you know the current situation at the moment um you know this is just a plan Uh, which is slowly getting pushed further back so yeah we could really do some support you know to get us through probably one of the worst times for our observatory as it always is around this time of year so you know guys if you want to help out you know the links are down there and um, you know the only other thing to say is you guys have an amazing day look after your loved ones and I'll say what I usually do as always bye for now